Hey kids, do you know what this is? Do you recognize this? Today we're going to be talking about sonnets. All right, um, so this is a very, very famous sonnet by William Shakespeare. Um, and a sonnet is a very particular type of poem. So we're going to use this in order to help us read Anne Hathaway and understand Carol Ann Duffy's poetry a little bit better. So we're going to look at Shakespeare's poetry, which is appropriate because Anne Hathaway was Shakespeare's wife, spoiler alert, um, not just a famous actress <laughs> who's alive right now. No, um, we're talking about Shakespeare's wife, Anne Hathaway, um, and sonnets. So if you're really familiar with sonnets, if you've looked at this super cool handout that's attached and you understand it all, great. You probably don't need this video. This is really to break down what is a sonnet and how do we know if something's a sonnet. And here's here's the key, you guys. If uh, Sonnets are really easy to identify. They have certain identifying marks that you don't have to understand a sonnet to know it's a sonnet. In fact, in Thomas Forster's famous or work that we love to read called um, How to Read Literature Like a Professor, he has a whole chapter called If It's Square, It's a Sonnet. Um, and obviously this is not exactly square, but compared to some of the other poems we've read, um, it is a little more square-ish. So there are certain things that we look for um, when we're trying to identify if something's a sonnet. And if it doesn't have these things, it just isn't a sonnet. It might be a really good poem, but it's not a sonnet. And the first one is that it has a certain length. So how many lines are in a sonnet? Well, let's count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Don't get mad at me. I have a kindergartner at home. But also, I think I could tell you, oh, it has 14 lines. But sometimes counting it out is actually helpful. There are 14 lines there. We know that. We just counted them. Okay? If it has 13 lines, not a sonnet. If it has 15, not a sonnet. It's got to have 14 lines. That's very important. So the next thing, once it has, you've determined as it has 14 lines, then we want to look at what's the rhyme scheme. So um, I'm going to actually change colors here. Let's see, maybe blue. So all we got to do now is look at the last words of all the lines. So we have day, and whenever we're figuring out rhyme, we always start with an A. So anything that rhymes with that is A. Day, and then temperate was the original pronunciation. We say temperate, but Shakespeare would have said temperate. Um, day and rate, listen, if this was Emily Dickinson, I would call it a rhyme, but Shakespeare's a little bit more precise than that. Um, not that he couldn't do a slant rhyme with the best of them, but if it was going to rhyme, it was going to rhyme for him. So that's a B. May is, oh yeah, that rhymes with day. And then date, temperate. Oh, hey, that rhymes. Nice. So this is going to keep going. A, B, A, B. You know, we have shines. That's a totally different rhyme. So what letter goes on there? If it doesn't rhyme with A and doesn't rhyme with B, then it's got to be our first C. Good. And then dimmed. Does it rhyme with day and May? No. Does it rhyme with temperate and date? No. Does it rhyme with shines? No. So it gets a new letter. And listen, I know some of you get this, and I also know that some of you don't. So I'm trying to take it through the same way I would do, you know, in class, um, just to make sure you understand, like, why are we writing these letters afterwards? Because it's basically a shorthand. Every A rhyme lines, uh, sorry, every line <laughs> that has A on it rhymes with all the other ones that have A. Every line with B on it rhymes with the other ones that have B. And they don't necessarily rhyme with the A's. So we can start to see a pattern emerge this way. So we have declines. Well, hey, gosh, that rhymes with shine. So that's C. Then we have untrimmed, and that rhymes with dimmed. So I'm starting to maybe notice a pattern already. I have A, B, A, B. I have C, D, C, D. Let's see if this pattern continues, shall we? Fade. Okay, kind of like day, kind of like eight, but not. It's its own new letter. Um, oast, that's a totally new sound that we have. Oest, um, was kind of the old fashioned, um, way to say, owes thou oest, you owe me, um, or that what you owe. Shade rhymes with fade. So we have E again and grow us. So you see, once I start to identify the pattern, it gets a little bit easier. I don't have to go back and check every time. Oops. Undo. All I have to really do now is make sure that the pattern is not being broken for any reason. So I am definitely noticing a pattern, A, B, A, B. So it's like every other line rhymes, right? And, and kind of in groups of four, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F. Okay, C, well, that's a whole new rhyme. And then V, ooh, 
Oh, I accidentally pressed undo instead of drawing the picture. Notice the and C rhyme. So this breaks the pattern. This is different. And in fact, the poem's over, so we don't really have time. So it's kind of like we have these three sections of four lines each. So three times four is 12. That makes sense. And then one little end rhyming. We call this a couplet. Two lines that rhyme with each other. GG. So this is the rhyme scheme for a sonnet that we must see. We must see 14 lines and they must rhyme like this in order for it to be an English sonnet. There's an Italian sonnet that has a different rhyme scheme, but we're not, we don't care about that. Sorry, Mr. DeLuca, not interested in what the Italian sonnet does. Um, we are interested in the English sonnet, the Shakespearean sonnet, and it has an A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G rhyme scheme. And that means that every single sonnet that's ever been written must follow that. And I'm going to show you, um, do I have it? Oh, it won't let me click off of this page because I have the writing up here, but every single sonnet, I've got a bunch of Shakespearean sonnets. And if you go through, you can quickly identify that this is the rhyme scheme. This is the length, that this is exactly what it'll look like. So that's two of the things we're looking for 14 lines in an ABAB rhyme scheme. And the other thing we're looking for is something you've definitely heard of called iambic pentameter. I don't feel like writing with my mouse. That's a nightmare. So I'm just calling it IP, iambic pentameter, iambic means that the rhythm that were broken up into chunks of rhythm that have two syllables each and they go da da like today or hello or wahoo okay those are iambic they go up at the end there's more of an emphasis you can't say them the other way you can't say today hello i guess you can't say that but it, it sounds weird right wahoo right you can't but it makes total sense to say it the other way Today, hello, wahoo. Um, and that's what we mean by iambic is that the pattern, if you didn't speak English and you just heard an iambic pattern and you had to just kind of clap along, you would say, da 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 I said clap along and then I snapped. Was that confusing for you? Um, it's kind of hard to hear the iambic pattern. All you need to know is that there are two syllables, that they're made up of like two syllable chunks. Okay, that's all you need to know. Two syllables. Pentameter comes from the root word penta, which means it happens five times. So boys and girls, you do not have to be English geniuses. You do not have to be math geniuses to understand a sonnet. All you need to know is that it is something of a two syllable pattern that is repeated five times. And what is five times 10 boys and girls and humans? Oh my gosh, I said five times 10. You're like 50 Miss Hollingsworth, you're stupid. Hey. Two times five is 10. So if you can count to 14, if you can figure out which words rhyme and see that it's in this pattern, and if you can count to 10 and identify syllables, which by the way, my daughter is in kindergarten. Syllables are not easy. Okay. Everybody messes up syllables, but she could, she could basically do this with a little bit of help. She could count to 14. She could break things down into 10 syllables and she could identify words that rhyme. And if she can do that, I think she's amazing, but she is not more amazing than you. You are 18 years old or very close to it. Um, you are capable of doing this as well. Okay, so iambic pentameter. So let's take a look at the first line. Shall I compare the two a summer's day? Oh my God, it's 10 syllables. Can you believe it? Wait, whoa, wait, wait, maybe it's a fluke. Let's do it again. Thou art more la vi and more tem per eight. Ten syllables. Rough winds do shake the dar ling buds of May. And sun mersley's hath thought too short a date. Right? If you keep going, it has ten. Does that mean Shakespeare never does nine? That he never does 11? Sure, he does, okay? Like, he's Shakespeare. He can do whatever he wants. But what we're looking for is that the prevailing pattern here, and the reason I chose this one is because it is so regular and it is almost perfect. Um, so that's what we're looking for. 10 syllables per line, and if you can feel that pattern, if you can start to clap it out, you'll notice it does follow it. It says, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. And you might be sitting there saying, Miss Hollingsworth, but we don't say summer's day. That's true, but if we just say, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? My emphasis is still on the suh, right? 
um, the I, the air, the two, the sa, the day. That's that's just where speaking naturally without putting any emphasis on it at all, that's where the emphasis hits. So you, when you exaggerate that rhythm, you can hear it a little bit more clearly. And you can also tell it by like, let's prove it wrong. Let's be scientists here. All right, so I'm saying that this is true. All you need to do is prove it wrong. So let's read it the other way. Instead of saying, shall I compare the two a summer's day, which sounds stilted, but not like an alien trying to speak English. Let's do it the other way around. Let's put the emphasis on the other syllables or the emphasis on the other syllables, right? Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? It almost sounds like I'm sneezing. <laughs> like it just doesn't sound normal. You probably wouldn't say summer day, but you all, but, but you would say that before you'd say summer day. All right. And if you can't hear it, just be like, my songs with I can't hear it. Move on. I'm going to count to 10. I can do that. If you start to hear it, you just have to tune your ear in. That's all it is. Okay. So I'm going to get rid of these. We've seen these, how these work out here. This has iambic pentameter, 14 lines, A, B, C, B, rhyme scheme, or sorry, ah, A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. I was back in Dickinson. Um, and we're going to start looking at something a little bit more sophisticated that doesn't just have to do with counting. Man, it took me a minute to get over here, but I'm here now. So if we take a look at this handout, hopefully this will make a little bit more sense to you where it says, the characteristic of a Shakespearean sonnet are 14 lines written in iambic pentameter, which is 10 syllable lines. Oops. The um, This is where it gets a little bit tricky. The first 12 lines are divided into three quatrains with four lines each. Hey, guess what? We already figured that out, right? They're four line groups. We call a four line group a quatrain. That's all that is. Um, and then it resolves in the final two lines of the couplet. Um, what, and then we have the rhyme scheme, A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. Where it's tricky is that, not tricky, the, the new part, the sophisticated part, is that the first three quatrains will set up a problem or a question. And then the final couplet will resolve the problem or answer the question or attempt to answer the question. So that's kind of what's fun about a sonnet is that you see this. So the very first section here says, should I compare you to a summer's day? No, you're more beautiful. May um, is sometimes rough and summer ends. The next quatrain says, sometimes it's too hot and sometimes clouds come and cover up the sunshine and everything that's beautiful sometimes, you know, gets ugly either because, you know, something bad happens to it or just with the ages of time. Okay. So we're seeing summer's not a good comparison because everything ends or is ruined eventually says, um, but, oh, there's a but here. This is line nine, the third quatrain, there will be a turn where like something else will say, but, but your eternal summer will not fade. You will never stop being beautiful. You, death will never own you because you will live forever in lines of poetry. Okay. And then the couplet says, as long as men can breathe and eyes can see, this will be alive and this will give you life. This will keep you alive, basically. So it's kind of interesting. It's, it's written as a famous love poem where he says, because I'm writing this poem about you, you'll be young and beautiful and alive forever. So is it really a love poem to the object of his affection? Or is it really a love poem to himself and his own skill or just the power of poetry in general? I don't know. So um, that's the Shakespearean sonnet for you. You can use that to analyze um, Anne Hathaway. Um, I want to show you, this is one of my favorite sonnets and you can look at it very clearly and see it's not a sonnet. It is 14 lines. <laughs> it does technically have an A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G rhyme scheme because all of them rhyme with each other. Um, and it does have a problem that's resolved in the final couplet, but it's not an iambic pentameter, but it does make me laugh. This is Billy Collins, who's um, a famous poet. He says, no, you're looking for a friend in a crowd of arising passengers. Not John Whelan, 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 John Whelan. Um, very silly, but there's a lot of different ways to interpret a sonnet. So when you're reading Anne Hathaway, I hope that you take all this into consideration and that it really helps you see the form and the skill that, um, Duffy used in writing the poem.